Umpa Lumpa Dupity Dunn. The estate of late children's author Roald Dahl, along with publishing house Puffin, have announced that they are reprinting some of Dahl's classic books, but with some changes for the modern reader. The texts have been looked over by so-called sensitivity readers in order to make them, quote, enjoyed by all readers. Some of the changes were implemented for political correctness, including erasing the implication that Oompa Loompas, who under these new changes are now gender neutral, were slaves, and removing cliches such as white as a sheet from the BFG, whilst some were implemented to follow an anti-bullying message, such as cutting down references to people's weight and ugliness. But whilst this was made with the best intentions, public figures ranging from author Salman Rushdie to Prime Minister Rishi Sunak have slammed the decision, claiming it infringes on tradition and free speech, and that literature from the past should only be viewed with the lenses from the time it was written and not through the modern eyes. But if modern eyes are the ones reading it for their enjoyment, shouldn't the language be adjusted to what they want, or should literature be preserved, warts and all? Is this another case of political correctness gone mad? If the writing is deemed problematic, what about Roald Dahl's problematic anti-Semitic views? Should older literature be edited for future generations? Yes, another brilliant setup for our uh, debate here by our uh, senior producer, uh, Joe Brown. So let's get uh, to it. Should uh, older literature be edited for future generations? As always, we begin with our quick fire round, 30 seconds each to lay out your initial stance on the matter, and we'll pick up uh, the conversation from there. So Miss India Willoughby, please take the lead. Your 30 seconds are on. Yes, absolutely. Books should be re-edited. Um, great books such as the Bible, Shakespeare and, and Agatha Christie, one of Agatha Christie's best known books, have all been rewritten to fit in with the modern times. We live in a, a, a developing world when sensibilities change. We live with a living language and it's quite right that we try and educate people going forward and words that used to be offence, uh, used to not be offensive, are mm. offensive now. And they should go, 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 go. <laughs> Natalie Blanford, your take. I don't think that the books themselves should be edited um, in the main body of the books, but I think a preface or an introduction could be added hmm. in which it's explained that these are period pieces, that these come from another time, uh, a time when we weren't aware of uh, how to put it, you know, I guess it's admitting blame if we say this, but it's sort of like saying at a time when it, people didn't have equal rights and people were discriminated against for all kinds of reasons. This is a period piece. Read it, think about it, discuss it and know that, that this wouldn't get written today. And it comes from a special time and um, not special, but an old Just time. Just a time. Yeah, yeah. Josh, time. Yeah. Josh Rome, your thoughts? Well, my instant thought, thoughts, first of all, is that these are texts written by an author. The author wrote them in the way in which he wanted to. By editing the text, you're actually editing his works. Therefore, you know, he's not around to defend the works. He's not around to justify his own works. And history is history for a reason. You learn from it. Hmm. And on that note, exactly. Let's uh, please feel free uh, to interact from this point uh, onwards. Uh, and let's begin with the most intuitive question. Is it about policing language or about liberating, expanding the, 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 the discourse, Josh? Well, I don't think by editing language you are liberating anything. In fact, you are only censoring. You, you, are, you are effectively trimming down a work um, to fit one point of view. You're not broadening horizons. You know, mm. Augustus Gloop and Miss Trunchbull were described as fat because they were meant to be fat. They were antagonists in the book. And, and it goes against the plotline. If we look specifically, Augustus Gloop was so fat that he clogged up the pipe. So therefore, you know, that whole plotline served as a device. You, you know, and... and and especially, he oh. was he was yes oh, presented we... as yeah. 
We're, we're having some technical difficulties uh, hearing you uh, well, uh, Joss, so we'll, we'll fix it. Uh, um, uh, Miss India uh, Willoughby, you know that I will borrow the uh, phrase from the security uh, sphere, a terrorist for one is the freedom fighter of the other, is what some call political correctness is progress for, for others? Yeah, I think it is, yeah, that's what we're looking for. We're looking to be progressive and uh, to make the world a better place. I think the, the point about the uh, Augustus Gloop and the word fat being removed, the, that is true, fat has been removed, but it's been replaced by the word enormous. Now, it's a matter of debate, which is the friendliest. I would actually say that calling somebody fat is more offensive than enormous. So it's not as if they are actually changing the plot of the book. And Roald Dahl himself actually rewrote his books a number of times while he was still alive. So I don't actually see anything wrong with being aware of modern sensibilities, what is offensive, and as long but as you're Ms. not- India, allow me to chime in yeah. here, because maybe we are the ones who are charging terms with a negative context. Why should the word fat be used as a, as an as an offensive term it is just merely describing r reality right we decided that fat is good or bad is offensive or not maybe we I, I, I will i will put it in the in a question <laughs> form maybe we are addicted to to victimology so to speak well well i think if you're a, a child at school uh, you're you're probably going to be called fat. It's one of those words that people are going to use to, to bully you, to pick on you. So I think for children um, to have a book read to them where fat is included and the grown-ups um, say that it's acceptable, it, is, it sends mixed messages. So that's why I think fat has been um, removed from Roald Dahl. Um could I, could I just join in here and just say that, just looking at this, we're talking about this um, word fat. So we had Augustus Gloop mentioned, but there's also a reference in James and the Giant Peach to this character called Aunt Sponge. And I have it here and it says, Aunt Sponge was terrifically fat and tremendously flabby at that. <laughs> now it's been changed. So the new version is, Aunt Sponge was a nasty old brute and oh. deserved to be squashed by the fruit. Now, terrifically fat sounds much worse. better, yeah. Yeah, because essentially I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to take away the idea that because someone is visually fat, it means that they're bad. They're trying to break this kind of causal yeah. chain whereby the word fat means bad and the word fat means a failure. And I think this is to do with this newer awareness in society that some people are fat and it's not their fault there are people who are plus size it's it's not an illness it's just a way that bodies are made you can be very very healthy but you can be larger now this is something i used to work in women's magazine so i come from the world where you know thin was good and fat was bad i know all about this i used to yeah. live in it daily um so i yeah. think it's very important to get rid of the word fat but what i don't like about the rewrite is now it's saying that because she was a nasty old brute she deserved to be squashed by a fruit she deserved to be hurt so i think this is sort of inviting more bullying it's like saying oh someone's not very nice fine go sit on their head well no don't sit on their head don't sit on their head and let's not assume that you're right and that the person's nasty maybe there's a debate about how to behave i feel like they're kind of missing like essentially if you're going to change it then maybe we need to change these people and not just the words but but um, uh, but i i will insist on the, on that uh, point uh, because uh, again circling back to perhaps my my poorly phrased argument here <laughs> who decided that fat was good or bad maybe the change is not by nixing the word fat but rather uncharging it with with a negative or positive context josh In this case, Royal Dahl wanted his fat character, so to speak, to be antagonist. So that's kind of where the negative connotation comes from. But at the same time, these are so these are stories that have been loved by generations. And you know what? Generations might not necessarily have had problems until now. But saying that, you know, these were descriptive words. These are what Royal Dahl, Royal Dahl um, wanted for the characters. So to kind of change them in such a way, effectively 
effectively, it's as the contributor said, it almost demonizes them more for a start. But number two, it takes away from the integrity of the original text. You know, we can interpret text in a different way. We can add maybe trigger warnings, explaining um, mm. certain certain viewpoints now. But in changing the text, you're, you're kind of removing the integrity almost of what the author wanted. And, you know, we can't just change history just to suit modern day narratives. The way we learn from history is by looking back on it, looking back on past actions and seeing how society has changed. And we view history through that lens by almost rewriting books. You are almost changing literary history here. <laughs> M well, well, I, would, yeah. I would disagree with that. I don't, I don't think there's a big leap and a big change from fact to enormous. I think you're keeping the, the essence of the story. And I, and I hear um, the, the, the other but argument India, about the, the other book as well. But I would say that that's more like cartoonish uh, type of violence, which I think kids get. They kind of get that. And we know, we're yes, talking about India, changing the odd words here and there. Shows. That's At the whole point. When... These, books, these characters are meant to be caricatures of people like that. They're meant to teach children a lesson up. in obesity, in gluttonous. That's the point. Augustus Gloop was so greedy that he couldn't stop himself from consuming right. chocolate. Therefore, he got uh, <laughs> stuck up the pipe. It's the same with Aunt Sponge and James and the Giant Peach. And also, we look at the <laughs> tractors <laughs> in Fantastic Bats. Mr. Fox. You know, they're, they're vehicles, for goodness sake. But that, yeah, you're but that's, kind of I think, fat is bad. That's a, you're circling back to what I said earlier, which is that we have we now live in a world where we know that yeah. not everybody who sort of visually appears as fat is fat because they're gluttonous. They might be fat because they have obesity, which was beyond their control. They could have hormone or thyroid problems or all manner of medical issues. We just, in the oh. 80s and the mm. 90s, no one was talking about this. No one had Google. No one had a Wikipedia page. Everyone was just like, one encyclopedia in the school library. Let's see what it says about being fat. You know, and um, essentially, I think this is why... It, they want to take out these references because it's this idea now that we mustn't assume just because someone's la I don't want to use the word fat because I'm scared of you know yeah. the repercussions but this idea that that means that they're in some way gluttonous so I get that you're saying that's what yeah. Roald Dahl was trying to do but I think the sensitivity reading readers now are trying to say well we can't use those words anymore because no, but those, we don't live in that those world. Those characters were overeaters. Augustus Gloop and Aunt Sponge were both overeaters. That's why they were fat. It is very much in the plot device. And to remove that almost removes the integrity of the piece and, and the way that Royal Dahl wanted these characters to be read out. That's why, the point. Why don't you like the word? Why? Why is? Why are you offended by the words enormous going in? Why? Why isn't that? Good I'm not enough? offended. I'm not offended. Well, it, 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 it was described as enormously fat. What I am offended by, or not, I shouldn't say offended, I'm not offended. I just disagree with it vehemently. I disagree with censorship of these texts and changing these texts when the author isn't around to justify it these days and changing the texts and almost kind of changing the integrity of the original piece, so to speak, and, because you're changing the way in which it's supposed to be read. And also perhaps erasing, as you've uh, previously said, suggested the historic progress society uh, uh, has made in, in this respect. And on that note, we're taking a very short break, but hold your thoughts right there because uh, we do have so much more to uh, unpack here, staying with us, dear panelists, and so should you, dear viewers. A few minutes break, and we're back with the summit. Welcome back to the summit. Still with us, Natalie Blanford, Josh Rome, and India Willoughby. Thank you all so very much for staying with us. We're also staying on topic, but first I want to start to take a listen to the British Prime Minister uh, chiming in there. Does it have anything to do with his uh, dire polling? I didn't say that. Let's take a listen. When it comes to our rich and varied literary heritage, the Prime Minister agrees with the BFG that you shouldn't gobble funk around with words. It is important that works of literature, works of fiction, are preserved and not airbrushed. We have always defended the right to free speech and expression. So let's get to it. Our culture wars, uh, an intentional uh, distraction, so to speak. Uh, so the powerful remain in power. Another quick fire round, 30 seconds each, and we'll pick it up uh, from there. Natalie, take the lead, please. 
Um, I, I don't think that they're an intentional distraction from politics because I don't think that the proponents of these changes know that they're going to cause quite the shockwaves they do. Of course, everyone's a bit more conscious now and, you know, everyone thinks, well, what, what will happen if I implement this change? But social media amplifies absolutely everything yeah. now so a tiny change you know moving a comma changing a pronoun and you're going to have tiktoks you're going to have twitter everyone is kind of you know on heat about this issue so i mean look if putin was making the changes or netanyahu was making the changes and i'd say yeah you know they're trying to distract from something but it's not that's not the case okay josh your thoughts yeah, I don't think these are um, a distraction at all. I think it's going to take far more uh, than a statement on a literary genius <laughs> to bring up Rishi Sunak's polling. Uh, you know, we're living in a cost of living crisis. You know, a bit of free speech and open debate doesn't hurt anyone. This is exactly what it is. And what the culture wars are and what they signify is people's genuine concern about where society is going and what they can and can't say in public for fear that they might get cancelled. They might lose their livelihoods just because of one opinion. India Willoughby, last but not least. Uh, it's absolutely to do with the culture wars. You've seen there, it's actually, you know, a few words that are being changed in Roald Dahl, and then Rishi Sunak leads into free speech. And before you know it, all the papers are full of this is an attack on free speech. So it's absolutely about culture wars. They're being used as a, as a distraction to much bigger things that are going on. And while we're arguing about changing words, we're living in an era where books are being withdrawn from school. LGBT education down the drain. You're not allowed to tell kids this anymore. And on that note, uh, let's please feel free to interact uh, once again. Maybe uh, uh, we, we're foc focusing on the wrong issue here. Maybe the argument for freedom of expression in that context belongs to those who are, to begin with, privileged, as in is being anti-PC is essentially an attempt to retain, uh, to retain power and dominance, Natalie. Um. I, I don't know. What do you mean by anti-PC? So, so, so the, the argument against political correctness uh, is essentially, again, a privileged argument yeah. because those who are arguing against it are, are not hurt by it. I think that, and I think also just to add that the people that have got the time to argue uh, against this are also quite privileged because there are people yeah. that are going to work every day yeah. at seven in the morning and are working a 12 hour shift and coming home. And as Josh said, worrying about the cost of living. And then you've got people who are just like, you know, chatting on Twitter and complaining about this. I think that is a privilege. Like the people that have read the entire old doll catalog and can right. complain about it and who can remember it. Those are the people that had a lovely upbringing where books were read to them or books were provided to them and they were able to engage with the books which is a wonderful thing and there is nothing like seeing a child love a book but it is a privileged position to even be able to sit here and I feel privileged being asked for my opinion Very on it my true. goodness of course um you know it, it, it's not entirely normal to have the time to do this kind of thing um so yeah I don't know if that if that's what you were asking but that's no, no, my but thoughts the, 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 your your answer was much better than than my question that's for sure <laughs> um, so. um uh, are we exchanging a dictatorship of freedom with a dictatorship of, of inclusiveness? Do, do you understand the argument at least? I, I don't really. I don't see what we're actually giving up at all. You know, um, when people talk about free speech now, they're often in very nice environments. They're not in um, deepest Siberia and, and looking for free speech because they're oppressed by a government. They're, they're generally, if it's on the Twitter sphere in social media land, free speech now means more or less the, the right to insult somebody invariably a minority and that's excused now as a point of view when it wouldn't have been and to me that isn't what free speech is about you know we live in a modern society uh, where I, I rate manners decency and respect way above free speech I think it's overrated but but is there a fundamental difference between a, a, a PC cen censorship and, and censorship a la, you know, China or Saudi or Arabia? Is PC just a liberal? No. Well, I, I think, yeah, I, I would say I think the difference there, and I think it's a really good point, a really astute observation you make there. I think when you talk about those types of things in Russia or China, uh, the things that are being changed are actual fact. You know, they're, they're, they're things that 
a, a meaningful in some way. Whereas I think over here, um, we, we're moaning about pronouns and, you know, fat to enormous, which really, in the scheme of things, are nothing, which reinforces your original question, is, is the culture wars a distraction from other things that are going on? Um, and to me, it absolutely is, plain as day. And, and, and Josh, uh, uh, on, on the flip side of it, you know, we, we no longer say chairman, but rather chairperson, uh, no policeman, but rather police officer. Shouldn't language be used as some sort of social machete here to, to pave the way to a different social climate through language? I mean, the thing is, policemen, people are also called police women. You know, fireman, firewoman, fisherman, fisherwoman. The word man is also in the word woman. Hmm. So, you know, that's that's one thing uh, to start off with. But also on the flip side of things, to counter India's point, it's not, free speech isn't the right to insult someone. No, that's hate speech. And there is a difference there. Free speech is the right to hold an honestly held opinion and not to necessarily be attacked for it. For example, you know, I've um, you know, on Twitter or whatever, I've been mm. on loads of programs where I've disagreed with Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. And simply because I've disagreed with Meghan Markle, I've been labeled a misogynist, a racist, and all of this sort of stuff. When I'm nothing of the sort, I have plenty of black friends, I have plenty of female friends, I'm not a misogynist, I am not a racist, I'm simply agreeing, I'm disagreeing with one woman and a man for that matter for both of their actions. But yet I am labeled all sorts of actions insulting words simply for holding those opinions and that's where this kind of PC um, aspect is going you know, we're seeing comics all the time be be um, around on social media for for you know giving comedy for making people laugh you know people have all different sorts of uh, points of view people have all different sorts of uh, sense of humors per se and people hold all different opinions that's democracy that's what democracy and freedom of speech is is the right to hold an honestly held opinion and not get cancelled for it to not lose uh, lose uh, one's livelihood over a mistake which you know that seems to happen all the time on social media people yeah. have moments of madness and then yeah. they get cancelled for it even after they apologize so so uh, natalie india in the short time we have left is cancel culture good for democracy natalie um I, I don't think so. I don't think cancelling someone because of one isolated incident is good for democracy. Uh, and I also don't really think censorship is good for democracy. But I just want to say one thing, which is Please. that if we're changing occupations of people and we're changing words from fat to uh, whatever the other word was, um, we need to look more carefully at what's in these books because I'm not suggesting that we change them. But Matilda, one of the most loved yeah. of Roald Dahl's stories, it's now a musical and a film, contains scenes of child abuse. And the new right. film that just came out that was a global hit on Netflix doesn't cut those scenes. I had to stop watching after about 15 minutes when um, Matilda started school and I saw scenes that to me reminded me of Auschwitz and the gas chambers and I saw lots of Holocaust references. If we're going to change one thing, maybe we need to look more closely and this is why I said about having a preface to just say, this is someone's work, he's no longer alive, make of it what you will, but okay. not changing yeah, it. Maybe we should just uh, look at uh, history, at human uh, uh, interaction straight in the eyes. Uh, India Willoughby, Natalie Bland for Josh Rome. Thank you very much uh, for joining us for, yes, this privileged yet important conversation.